Hi, I'm Arlen Walker and I'm live from Helm's Wasteland and today I have got a uh, sort of an update video about the Merrick of the Multiverse campaign, which is basically to say um, that at least for right now I'm going to put that campaign on hiatus. Um, there are uh, a number of reasons for that um, and I felt like it would be worth kind of doing a, a video like this to sort of talk about a lot of those reasons the, the the core one essentially being that you know I'm you know I feel like there are other ways that I could have more fun with the, the time and energy put in um, and a lot of that has to do with the way that I think some of the core ideas of America the Multiverse were good and some of them weren't as good, essentially. Um, which is basically to say that as with lots of things, I think that um, I myself benefit from uh, embracing the sort of flexibility to say, you know what, instead of kind of trying to, you know, stick with it out of a kind of... Uh, misaligned sense of, of kind of stubbornness, why not just kind of, you know, take what you learned and go back to the drawing board and, you know, practice some iterative design, right? Um, and so that's what I am planning on doing um, with regard to solo play stuff, um, which is to say that I really like the idea of having a sort of solo play something that um, as a sort of standard kind of Friday feature on the channel, for lack of a better term. Um, I've had uh, a couple of sort of real life health issues that have made it uh, more difficult to sort of stay on schedule. Um, in particular, um, uh, starting a couple of weeks ago, I started having really, really bad um, allergies, reactions to, to seasonal allergies, um, like many people in this part of the world, um, because my, you know, the air is full of oak pollen and all sorts of other crap. Um, and then I hurt my shoulder, which is, is mostly better. Um, I'm still wearing the, the sling basically, um, as much as anything to kind of remind myself to, uh, take it easy on this arm. But, um, I think it's going to be, I think by the end of the weekend, I'm going to be feeling like the sling is, uh, you know, more harm than good. And I don't need to wear it at all. But for right now, I'm, I'm still trying to be patient about, um, leaving it on and, and kind of not um get to kind of feeling sorry for myself feeling like an invalid or anything like that um which is uh you know working on it not not 100 percent, but getting there um anyway and that has kind of uh the the big thing with both of those is basically that i sort of got behind on a lot of stuff and um you know i uh need to get 40 hours a week of work done um then then the you know the youtube channel stuff kind of has to come secondary to that uh, because that's you know what you know pays the bills so um anyway all of that is just to say um that i uh appreciate all of you guys sticking with me um through some kind of uh slightly more tumultuous um time on the channel I would, I'm really looking forward to getting back into some kind of regular solo play stuff. And I have a couple of ideas um, that I'm going to kind of tinker with in a number of ways. Um, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to kind of grab onto as much. Um, but I have a number of kind of different somewhat related or related uh, ideas. And I, I need to just kind of uh, sit down and put some time in on those. And I will say with regard to America, the multiverse, I thought that um, fate condensed as the sort of core system that we sort of started with and then gradually made more and more sort of tweaks to over the course of the campaign. Um, but I thought that system worked really well. I had a lot of fun using fate I think that I, um, in a number of places, kind of didn't entirely uh, 
excuse me, sort of take advantage of all of the things that fate can do. Um, and in particular, I think there were a couple of places where I sort of fudged things a little bit uh, just based on kind of the way that the system works. So like in particular, um, there's a, a sequence in the fifth episode where Merrick scares off a bunch of soldiers using his, his fight um, skill. And that's not how fate works. Um, uh, when I sort of went back through that, I was like, okay, so if you want to be able to do something like that, the expectation is that you take a stunt that allows you to do something like that, right? You sort of declare what you want to do and then pick the skill that is relevant to that thing. Um, although if you're sort of moving into kind of fate accelerated approaches style, you can get away with a little more of something like that. And that may speak to that I should uh, do something with fate accelerated solo instead of fate uh, condensed or core next time, which are very, there's um, uh, fate accelerated is sort of like a different skill list for fate core. It's, it's basically like, a lot of the same stuff with a couple of different kind of it's like same system different expressions if that makes sense um right um anyway but um yes i will say uh what I, one of the things i wanted to say is i don't think that the sort of issues that i'm having with america the multiverse are at all related to the underlying system which i had a, an absolute blast with and um, i'm really looking forward to doing more with that um in particular i really i kind of expected that it's something that i would like but i really feel like the 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 four fudge dice four fate dice um roll is uh somehow it, it really hits kind of the sweet spot for me in terms of um, variability, that there is kind of some variability, but it's, you know, because of sort of the bell curve and the centered on zero, you get a whole lot of your kind of, you know, a whole lot of the, the sort of numerical elements come from static things instead of the role, right? As opposed to like in, in like a D and D sort of game, if you're rolling a D 20, like to hit a certain AC, right? That it's, you know, there's the AC and your attack bonus and the D 20 and they all kind of factor in, but often, um, you know, until you get to very, very high level, the, uh, you know, especially at low level play, I guess is the way to put it that the, the D 20 role is, the sort of more significant element of the combat than sort of the bonuses and stuff, right? Um, depending on the sort of particular expression of D&D that we're talking about and all that. But anyway, um, so yes, I, I really liked <coughs> a lot of the underlying system stuff. And I think there's a lot of kind of cool things that I sort of figured out about what I would want to do next based on kind of messing with the system um, and sort of using like different alternate rules and, and kind of tinkering with a number of the pieces. Um, but simultaneously, I think that there are some underlying issues with America the Multiverse. Um, in particular, so I had a, a table of 20 multiverses, um, and I think one issue with that is that I sort of started feeling like we were going to end up going, or I was going to end up going through sort of the same story over and over again, especially at the start, right? That sort of once we sort of got into a particular um, multiverse that we might end up with more kind of divergence, but that especially at the start, it was going to be some version of, you know, Merrick, it wakes up in particular multiverse and has to figure out how to kind of attach himself to, you know, the sort of power structure and, and goes on a quest or whatever and comes back and then gradually things kind of open up from there. Um, and that sort of defeats the purpose of having all those multiverses, right? If you're going to do the same thing over and over again. Um, and there were a couple that I had sort of thought, well, you could do something kind of interesting and different in those um, to sort of move away from that. But I don't think I, I think that I ended up kind of overemphasizing um, 
all of these kind of varieties of settings and not enough thought went into the kind of variety of sort of story structure that we were going to get into in all those different multiverses. And that um, is partly because story structure is kind of hard, right? There, there's a, a sort of coming up with weird setting stuff that is interesting is, is uh, not necessarily always easy, but I do think it is kind of easier than a sort of close analysis of like how a, a story is structured. Um, and as a result, I think I sort of started feeling like I described where we were going to end up just sort of doing the same thing over and over and over again until we got to the point where there could be a sort of divergence. And that doesn't seem very fun to me in a lot of ways. Um, and I don't necessarily know exactly how I would kind of fast forward through all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think there are probably ways that you could kind of work on that but it seems like that gets into kind of at some point you're not really like playing a solo rpg you're just sort of telling a story right if if you know the the idea being that you know if we wanted to you know start merrick off kind of you know part way through his kind of character arc within this particular multiversal setting um what about kind of all of the sort of stuff that came before and the way that the stuff that came before defines what comes after, right? And so there's a sort of question there. And anyway, all of that is to say, um, I think that was a, an issue. And I also think that one of the things I kind of had as an idea was that, you know, continuity provided by the character of Merrick, um, but that that didn't quite work as well as I was hoping um, especially in that sort of early phase where, you know, Merrick is sort of connecting to all of these different multiverses, right? But sort of before he has made a strong connection with any kind of characters and, and setting elements in any of these different multiverses, right? That, that means that there isn't excuse me, very much kind of continuity between, excuse me, between all these things at all. And I think there's some things I could have done. I could have sort of uh, pushed towards the kind of um, meta plot story of Merrick kind of trying to, you know, figure out what's going on with the the magical stuff and, and all of that um, and the actual sort of multiverse hopping element. But I, um, anyway, yeah. So my sort of idea right now um, and I've got a couple of sort of things that I want to work on. There's there's a, a couple of different places that I want to go. Um, one is basically to collect a lot of sort of... Oh, and there's one more sort of major thing for Merrick, and I, I think I'll talk about it for a second before I get into kind of what I want to do next. Um, and that is that I um, kind of ended up getting very uncomfortable with the idea of uh, using art or images or whatever that I didn't necessarily know kind of exactly kind of where it came from and who to credit. Um, sort of had a, a realization about that, that, you know, if I were a, a, a visual artist, that I wouldn't want people to use my stuff without me knowing and without crediting me and all that sort of stuff. And so that seems like that's a sort of important kind of point about the sort of respect for um, artistic craft, right? And and the idea of, you know, that in the same way that, you know, I would want somebody to credit me if they were going to use any of my stuff, that I should credit them if I'm going to use their stuff. And um, I sort of ended up, my kind of first thought was, well, I had a couple of ideas of things that could be done about that, but I ended up basically, um, the, the sort of two big ones were A, use public domain stuff, and B, use um, a sort of generated word cloud related to the setting. Um, and the generated word cloud thing, I think, is kind of an interesting idea, and I would like to do a little more with it. Um, but I think it's going to be more useful in some slightly different ways than I had imagined at first. Um, I think it's going to be more useful as a way to kind of 
um, create a sort of visual representation of like a lot of just kind of things that really like excite me and interest me as a way to kind of sort of brainstorm essentially. Um, and that in the same way, um, the public domain stuff, I thought I, I found a lot of really good public domain kind of art and, and photos and things like that. Of, but I ended up kind of gradually feeling like that, that sort of wasn't quite, uh, not that it wasn't going to work, but that I was sort of doing a lot of, uh, stuff for a project that, um, I wasn't necessarily really kind of interested in doing that much more on, at least right now, in terms of, of playing in the America, the multiverse, multiverse. And so I sort of said, okay, well, why not um, kind of leave that sort of stuff where it is and I can kind of use it for when it comes time to use it, um, but not necessarily try to kind of turn that into backgrounds for, for or collages like I do for America, the multiverse, multiverses. Um, yeah, and that's a, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and I've been sort of thinking a lot about the idea of sort of, you know, public domain art versus like a, a specific artist, especially like, you know, uh, there's a sort of legal component and a moral component. And um, I guess one of the things for me is that, uh, in my opinion, what makes a kind of stronger emphasis on me is actually sort of the moral component that like, you know, using art from like a, a particular uh, game book, right? Using like art that um, appears in one of the Paizo bestiaries for Pathfinder 1 for a um, kind of standard D&D-ish RPG game. That doesn't bother me a whole lot um, in the sense of like, well, it's Paizo stuff. They can, you know let me know if they care. Um, but that the idea of sort of like using a, an artist's like, you know, a, a piece of art that's sort of, you know, like a, 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 something that they, you know, aren't necessarily like, you know, doing on commission, but are kind of, you know, doing as a, a something that speaks to them, I guess is a way to put it that that somehow is, uh, less appropriate, less, less, uh, doesn't work as well for me um, anyway. And that therefore I um, wanted to move towards public domain stuff, which is probably one of the things I'm going to be doing going forward is, is trying to make sure that when I use um, images in, in videos, that they are things that are either kind of directly associated with what I'm doing under a sort of fair use structure. So like using a, um, a game's cover image for a thumbnail for a, an overview of that game that I think pretty clearly falls under fair use, right? But the idea of like, you know, using, you know, art that I found online that I think is really cool, but that I don't necessarily know who to credit and, you know, whether they charge for it or anything like that as like, you know, character art in a a session or something that just doesn't work for me as well. Um, and wanting to kind of move away from that. And anyway, so that's just a, it's not a, a huge deal or anything. And, and, um, yeah, I, I just kind of feel like that's appropriate to what I want or the, the sort of content that I want to create, if that makes sense. Um, anyway, all of that aside, I have been thinking a lot about what I might want to do next. Um, and I've got a couple of ideas. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about, there's sort of two, two sort of main sort of spheres of thought right now. Um, and one of them is to do something that is, um, a little bit like Merrick of the multiverse in the sense of having this kind of, uh, you know, disjointed story, but where the setting is kind of the, the source of connectivity um, and the, the sort of connection between these different things. And so like maybe a, a kind of setting 
where we might see like this this kind of like a like a region through the ages or something like that kind of you know and have that sort of idea of this this kind of you know setting and this world as the the sort of character that provides continuity throughout all the different stories that are kind of set in in kind of different areas different places and also maybe different time periods right that you could sort of have like you know the different periods that fit into this uh world and that might be something really interesting i don't entirely know how i would do that and how to avoid some of the pitfalls of america the multiverse although i do think one of the things that would be cool is to sort of use certain kind of random generation tools that might have like an element of history in them right so like for instance if in in kind of D, &D terms right you could have like a random settlement generator right but then you could also sort of use the random settlement generator to generate up ruins that are you know no longer occupied as of the sort of later time period right and that might be kind of an interesting idea in some ways um I'm going to sort of work on piecing those bits together um, and then kind of how I might do something like that. Um, the other idea is to do something that um, one kind of realization that I had when talking to a, a buddy actually this morning about solo play um, was this idea of, you know, if you're playing solo, one of the advantages of playing solo that I have found has to do with um, expectations and, and managing expectations, right? Because um, one of the things that sort of goes into being a, a good game master has to do with sort of communicating and managing expectations, right? You know, laying out kind of, you know, here's the sort of game that we're going to play. Here's, you know, or, or that I would like to play. Let's, you know, talk about what sort of games you guys might like to play, all of that sort of stuff in a way that kind of, you know, make sure that everybody is on the same page. And that one great thing about solo is that you sort of automatically always on the same page in some ways, right? That, you know, um, you kind of get what you're going for very, very um, intuitively, even if it also sometimes helps to kind of spell it out for yourself almost, right? Like the idea of, you know, writing notes down as a way to kind of clarify the concepts. Um, and with that in mind, one of the sort of ideas that I was kind of thinking about is that, you know, you don't have to play stuff that doesn't interest you. Um, and that sounds like a kind of obvious thing. Um, but one kind of idea that I had was with regard to sort of like, um, play structures and especially the sort of idea of kind of classical uh sort of D, D style dungeon adventuring um that you know for example um and i was sort of reminded of this on a, another discord server fairly recently that uh, there were some guys talking about some of the sort of early uh tsr era uh, modules and one of the things that was discussed is sort of wilderness travel and how these different TSR modules um, dealt with traveling like from civilization to the entrance to the dungeon um, and one of the sort of things that they got into was that in a lot of the sort of more low level stuff they actually didn't do much in terms of like mechanical stuff that you know there's a sort of you know like a passage of a block text that, you know, the, the DM reads to the party as they, you know, traipse through the forest to get to the, the dungeon site, but that there's not a lot of that kind of, you know, like, you know, uh, measuring out rations and, and um, trying to, you know, kind of the, the sort of procedural of, of hex crawling and things like that is just not really as present and that it seems to become more present as you get to some of the higher level stuff and that's sort of where wilderness adventure kind of becomes more of an expectation in some ways um i thought that was kind of an interesting i thought and and to combine those one idea that i had was that 
you could play an RPG that kind of only uses the parts of the adventure that you're really interested in at any given time. And in particular to kind of embrace the idea of sort of expandable structures to build on. Um, and I've been, that's been a, a thing that has been kind of lodged in my mind for some time now is this idea of, um, you know, what if you built something that is not necessarily designed to be kind of feature complete when you start playing? Because I think that's one of the things that has made me less interested in certain um, solo play things that I've done is kind of doing all this prep and getting everything ready and then sitting down and being like, okay, we're done with the sort of design phase. We're into play phase. Um, and that one of the things I really liked about the America, the multiverse stuff was the sort of combination of those two and that you could sort of intentionally do that. Right. And especially with solo play where you don't necessarily have to worry about, well, you know, what if the, the, you know, the, the ranger player is going to be sad about the fact that there's no wilderness stuff in the sort of game procedure yet. Right. That you don't, that, you know, that just sort of doesn't entirely matter right because there is no other ranger player right it's just me um and so i've i'm not entirely sure what i would do on that front but my kind of loose idea right now is to do something with um torchbearer second edition um and i'm not sure why it is that that game is sort of speaking to me right now um Although it might have something to do with the fact that I spent a whole lot of money on physical copies of that game recently. Um, but aside from that, I do think there's a there's there's some interesting stuff in that game. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of stuff from the Torchbearer first edition era as well as the Torchbearer Sagas kind of licensed stuff that is sort of third party content for Torchbearer. And I don't know how compatible it all is but my understanding is that it's fairly broadly compatible um that one of the big things that torchbearer 2 did was it sort of took the kind of core a lot of the core concepts and kind of built on them in a more sort of like deliberate and um uh, uh explicit way i guess um rather than just sort of saying here's how Kind of conflicts work and you can use any skills that you want to, to fit a particular conflict that they have more of like you know here's kind of a, a whole bunch of examples sort of forms of conflict to uh use in in play um that sort of thing and so i sort of feel like well you know in that case um i'd kind of like to to use a lot of the stuff that i have and haven't gotten much of a chance to use um, and one idea that I had is, you know, you don't have to do sort of wandering through the wilderness to get to the dungeon. You could just do like, here's the phase that happens in the dungeon. And then here's the phase that happens back in town until you're ready to add wilderness to it in some ways. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. And then one of some of the other things that I've been thinking about are like, well, you don't have to kind of do dungeons in the same way that lots of times dungeons have been done um in particular that you don't necessarily have to do like a a top down here's a map of all of the hallways and rooms um there's a i think it's in um red tide um i don't remember if that's a specific name but it's it's a, a kevin crawford cine nominee um Kevin Crawford, who did uh, Worlds Without Number and Stars Without Number and Wolves of God and Scarlet Heroes. Um, I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, Red Tide is the name of a supplement that is designed to deal with kind of uh, sort of building space for adventuring to happen in um, and also for kind of creating interesting sort of game structures for like higher level player characters who like you know what do you do when they build the castle right uh and when they reach like ninth level and things like that in an osr game um 
And if I remember correctly, the um, I'm, I'm going to go back and sort of look through all this stuff before kind of finalizing any plans, of course, but that there's a sort of idea of um, kind of nodal based structure where you basically just have like, you know, here's an interesting thing and then here's the things that it connects to. And you don't necessarily need like a, you know, top down dungeon view of every corridor. You just sort of say, okay, well, there's, you know, there's the armory here and there's the barracks here and there's a, a connection between them. Um, and my sort of idea is, well, you could, you know, use some of that kind of abstraction and extrapolation with regard to something like Torchbearer to sort of build sort of procedural dungeon stuff to adventure in um, as part of the process of play in some ways, right? That that seems like something that would be totally workable um, and would be kind of an interesting project to work on, especially with regard to this idea of the sort of uh, unfinished game uh, as a as a kind of deliberate element, right? That you could say, okay, so you know, I, you know, maybe at one point I want to have kind of like these three nested random tables, but I'm just going to do the top level one right now, and then you know, for next session I'll do another one, and then next I'll do another one, and kind of build out the procedure over the course of play. Um, so that there is that kind of design element that is a part of the, the, the game, right? And that seems like an interesting concept in a lot of ways to sort of tinker with. Um, so I don't entirely know. I'm not uh, totally sure what it is that I'm going to do. Um, so it will probably in part depend on kind of what I end up reading over the weekend and what inspires me, um, uh, and, and all of that sort of stuff. But, uh, I'm, I'm definitely interested in both of those ideas and a number of kind of other things that are sort of flickering around. Um, I, I've been sort of tinkering with ideas of how to do something kind of Star Wars-y, and I've been thinking about, um, a number of other bits and pieces, uh, a number of systems that I've been looking at recently that are really interesting and that I would like to tinker with also. And it's, you know, not enough time in the day, to be honest, right? It's only 24 hours in the day and, you know, I need to sleep for like eight of them uh, and, and work for, you know, a number of them every week and all that sort of stuff that, you know, just run out of time. Um, so all of that is to say, um, hope that, Anyone who was enjoying following Merica the Multiverse is uh, not too disappointed to hear that it is going to uh, be at least on pause for a little while. I would, I, I feel like uh, it's worth kind of saying that I, I really would like to kind of return to something like that, but I think it needs some kind of tinkering and tweaking to get it to the sort of point that I am interested in um, getting it to, to sort of pick it back up. And so I'm not entirely sure when that is going to happen, but at some point it would be fun to do something with that. So anyway, um, yeah, a little bit of a different thing today. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I'm going to get sort of back into the flow of normal stuff or normal kind of, uh, production for YouTube, for lack of a better term, very soon, um, especially as my arm heals up um, and as I kind of, you know, get uh, back into a sort of homeostatic state. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I um, hope everyone is doing well, staying safe, staying healthy, and having lots and lots of fun gaming. Um, you can uh, leave a comment down below. You can hit me up on Twitter. You can send an email to pelhamswasteland at gmail.com. All sorts of ways to get a hold of me. Um, and uh, yeah, it's always great to hear from you guys. Otherwise, I've been Arlen Walker. I've been live from Pelham's Wasteland. And I will see you next time. Take care, everybody. <laughs>